Coming up next, the bookening continues to discuss its favorite novel of the year. It's not even a novel. It's not our favorite. It's The Doubleers by James Joyce. My voice is completely shot. Fun fact about this booking: we're recording it directly after recording some pickups for Sound of Sanity. I was shouting at someone, wasn't me, who had basically ruined everything, and it's shot my voice a little bit. But <clears throat> welcome to the booking. I'm your humble and obedient hoist. Uh, hoist. <laughs> I'm, your, I'm your humble and obedient hoist. Um, and I'm uh, up there. What's that? <laughs> just pick yourself up there. <laughs> just pick myself up. <laughs> like a hoist. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> All right, just going to pause for the audience to finish laughing. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's rich. All right. <laughs> I'm just checking my watch. They're probably done now. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the beginning. My name is Nathan. I'm your humble and obedient host. Joining you for our second episode on the Dubliners. Over there, we got Brandon Chastine. He's the pastor who's a master of reading. Nope. How you doing, Brandon? <laughs> no? <laughs> nope. You're not the master of master of reading. No. You don't even have a, you have a degree in divinity? Nope. You you pastor people. You care about people's souls. I mean, I care for people's souls, but I'm not a pastor. You're like a shepherd, like a pastor. You're the ma- pastor who's a no. master of reading. No. No. I think he's sitting over there. All right, over there, we got Jake Mentzel. He's the scholar who's a baller of reading. True. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, I'm also the pastor who's a master of reading. Yeah. I'll just bow uh, out I'll now. just take both of those <laughs> Jake will just be having conversations with himself before you know it. And we've got our special guest star. Whoa. He just happened to be just happened to be passing by. I didn't expect to be inducted. It's it's Benjamin Solzer from Sound of Sanity. How you doing, Ben? I'm good, Nathan. How are hey, you? Hey, what, what's Sound of Sanity if Booking fans aren't listening to Sound of Sanity? Tell them what it is. Oh, Sound of Sanity is a show about three guys and we talk about things that make us feel insane and we attempt to provide a little bit of sanity to our listeners that's along absolutely with some, right along with some humorous stuff there is there are some humorous stuffs and huh. things sounds very different than the booking <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> that's right <clears throat> now who do you think obviously me and jake we're the dynamic duo we're the dynamic yeah. duo yeah robin and batman batman and robin who would be the best third to join us. Join you for the sound of Santa? <laughs> or for the No, book. he means period, buddy. Oh. This period. Oh. I think he's saying this town ain't big enough for the four oh, of us. I see. You know, I, I really don't know. I think Brandon has established his position with you guys long before me. Oh, uh, so he, he carries guns. Got a six <laughs> shooter. Oh. And Brandon carries yeah, guns. Yeah, I mean, you can see it right over here. <laughs> I carry these guns <laughs> right here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Terrified. <laughs> <laughs> he flexed his muscles, folks. If you weren't able to imagine, pro- appro- I'm assuming you could, you could appropriately imagine that joke. But if you couldn't, then that's what happened. And once again, we'll pause. Wait for the laughter to die down. That was a funny joke. Why am I making fun of it? I'm just being a jerk. <laughs> I'm sitting right beside him and I couldn't see it. So, Oh, you couldn't see the guns. Because <laughs> I'm wearing a coat. Right. Oh. Yeah, because you're wearing a coat. A large baggy why, coat yeah. that contains multitudes of muscles, just like I contain multitudes of personalities, and other people contain. <laughs> is it, I, I, can t- I contain multitudes. That's like a thing that someone said, right? That's a famous literary quote. Yeah, it's like Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman. He contains yeah. multitudes. I'm kind of like Walt Whitman. You don't want to say you're like Walt Whitman. <laughs> just move <laughs> on. <laughs> a spontaneous me. <laughs> um, oh, little blade of grass. <laughs> <laughs> See, these are the kind of literary jokes we make on the bookening, Ben. I wouldn't expect you to understand what we're talking about, obviously. I don't, but I'm laughing anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of your job. <laughs> All right, Ben, we're going to let you get out of here, but first you're going to help us with donor shout-outs. You ever heard about donor shout-outs? I have. Yeah, I love donuts. Oh, Ben, you love donuts? <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you say donors? <laughs> okay, I, yeah, donors. Donors, I, I got it now. Yes. Okay, now we'll pause for <laughs> exactly one person to stop laughing, Ben. <laughs> um, we have donors, 
and they pay us money. And if they pay enough money, then we shout them out. You want to help us shout them out just for fun and kicks and giggles? I would. Well, why don't you shout out Rhonda and Robert, the lovebirds? Rhonda and Robert? The Lovebirds. That wasn't much of a shout out, Bet it has to be a shout out. Oh, okay. Rhonda and Robert, the Lovebirds. All right. And Jake, why don't you shout out John and Jill, the Lovebirds, and Max, their son. John and Jill, the Lovebirds, and Max, their son. And Brandon, I'm sure you'll want to shout out Beth, the beloved mother of our beloved host. Beth, the beloved mother of our beloved host. You guys just both got owned, shout out wise. Those, that was a shout out. I'm kind of okay with that. <laughs> All right. Ben, this is your chance to show yourself to be the true third member of the dynamic duo. I, I don't see how that's possible mathematically, but I'll, I'd love to try. <laughs> <laughs> Do it, let's hear it for Maya. Maya. Huh. <laughs> Jake, do you want to maybe do the Maya one? So. No, no. Well, you <laughs> I'm can, just going to let that one ride. <laughs> you can do Jay and Katie from Madison who are cold and love cheese. Jay and Katie from Madison who are cold and love cheese. It's like Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Come Brandon, on down. <clears throat> you can do your best Saturday Night Live for Mr. Benjamin Tiberius. Mr. Benjamin Tiberius. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh... Uh, ben Solzer, you do Nathan, not Nathan. Nathan, not Nathan. <laughs> and uh, we got Eric and Catherine, the lovebirds. Wait, wait. Didn't, th- didn't... Where I said them. No. You sure? No, we, yeah, and we did Jill and... Oh, done, Jill and there's, there's, okay. there's more than one set of lovebirds, which, by the way, Well, yeah, Jay we've already Katie, done two of them. We know your lovebirds, too, Jay and Katie. We understand, but you're also from Wisconsin, and you love cheese, and uh, you're, you're cold. cold. So, you know. But not cold-hearted. <clears throat> but not cold-hearted, but, you, but we understand. You're the lovebirds, too. We don't want to... So who who is this? Eric and Catherine, the Eric lovebirds. And, Eric and Catherine, the lovebirds. And finally, I need all three of you guys to give a big booking shout out <laughs> for our good old friend, Dr. X. Dr. X! I thought it was <laughs> Professor X. It is. I'm sorry. I suck. <laughs> Why did you do that? But I didn't mean to. My brain played a trick on me. All right, let's do a booking shout out for Professor X, please. Professor X! <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ben, get out of here. All right, Nathan, I there, will. There can be only one, and for the booking, it's Brandon. Uh, but hey, I'll see you over on Sa- Sound of Sanity next Tuesday. Nice. Awesome. We'll be talking about something. It'll be awesome and fun and cool, and people Christmas, should listen. Christmas, man. No, Christmas. Yeah, Christmas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what's coming. That's what's coming, yeah. <laughs> All righty. Now get out. Bye, Bye ben. guys. <clears throat> Goodbye, Ben. We Bye, Ben. You. Well, folks, that was a fun interlude, but now we have to talk about the Dubliners. <laughs> <Ugh>. <laughs> Here's what I want to say about the Dubliners. Have we already gotten through all the stuff? Yeah. I don't think we did it. We never did our baggage, did we? Yeah, we did our baggage. Did we? We did yeah, our baggage. I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Surely some... But he talked about baggage. I don't remember talking about my baggage. The airplane went over. We did baggage. Here's what I want to say, Brandon, about these Dubliners. What about them? You said that James Joyce basically invented the epiphany, right? He's Mr. Epiphany guy. Mr. He thinks he's so cool because he invented the epiphany. He at least popularized it, Nathan. And the epiphany is what again? It's that moment at the end of the story where this character has a moment of self-understanding and revelation. What's a famous example from a thing that everybody knows? Well, and what most of our listeners might know, Mm -hmm. a good man is hard to find at the end where the grandmother is about to be killed by the misfit. Mm -hmm. She reaches out and tries to touch him and says, why you could have been one of my own sons. Mm -hmm. And then she shoots. She she doesn't shoot him. He shoots her. (laughs) And she shoots him. (laughs) She shoots him dead. This is my revisionist history of... (laughs) A good man is hard to find. It'll soon be outed. That would be... Bookstores. (laughs) Reading that next year. That's, uh, yeah. From the history of the bookening, another one would be at the end of Anna Karenina, right before she throws herself under the train. Yeah. She has that bright moment of epiphany where she realizes maybe she didn't want to do this. Yeah. And then she has no choice after that. I'm pretty good friends with a police officer, and he says it's very sad how many suicides obviously regretted, We're regretted. in the moment. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there, but you don't want to have those epiphanies too late. And just don't commit suicide, folks. That's what I'm trying to say. What were we talking about? Oh, epiphanies. And so the famous epiphanies in the, de- in, or in the dead, it's the whole story is leading up to the epiphany where he realizes... His wife had a lover before him. And every I, how do I know anyone? And am yeah. I blah, blah, blah. So there's that. 
But for Mr. Epiphany, man, I don't know how many. What I'm getting to is, as I read this story, I honestly, I'll just confess, I'm not well versed in James Joyce. I did not know that he was famous for the Epiphany, but mm-hmm. I was aware that epif- an Epiphany was a thing that happened in a short story. And I kept thinking, where are the Epiphanies? Man, if this had some Epiphanies, it would sure be good. Yeah. And I realize our listeners are going to say, like, well, what about this story? What about that story? Well, you'd have two counter arguments. They would either say, what about this? Because you do have it in some places. I can't remember any of the names of the stories. Let's see. What's the one about the gamblers? Yeah, where he's in the car and he's getting drunk. After the race? Yeah. That's that's got a nice epiphany to it. Let's find it. It's page forty three, and it's not necessarily that the uh, characters have the epiphany themselves. Mm-hmm. It can be an epiphany for the reader too. Okay. So he knew that he would regret in the morning, but at present he was glad of the rest, glad of the dark stupor that would cover up his folly. He leaned his elbows on the table and rested his head between his hands, counting the beats of his temples. The cabin door opened, and he saw the Hungarian standing in a shaft of gray light. Daybreak, gentlemen. And that's the last line. And so here's this guy. He's wasted all his fortune in one night, at least a lot of his money in one night. He doesn't want day to come. He just wants to rest, let his drunken stupor pass over him. And then you have the door open and it's this guy saying it's daybreak. So it's a nice little sharp poetic moment at the end of the story. It's a nice sharp poetic moment. I guess, I don't know, what am I trying to say? What what I'm actually doing is leading to what I actually thought about these stories and what we, let's like, what did you guys think about these stories is the question I'm getting to here. And I'm starting by saying what I thought was Joyce's profound mistrust of humanity to learn or better itself or find any kind of redemptive anything and anything that happens to itself wore on me and was pretty obnoxious and made most of the stories feel pointless with the exception of t- the two stories we're going to spend most of our time talking about, which are Araby and the dead. But like the sisters, remembering someone who died is hard. That's the one about the priest that died. Mm-hmm. And Encounter, it's like, we met a creepy old man. It was creepy. Evelyn, the woman's going to flee with the sailor. And then she doesn't because she's trapped because actually it turns out whatever. So maybe there's an epiphany for me, which is that humanity sucks and we're all trapped by our own demons and life is hard. But man, that got old after story after story. And that's kind of how I felt about the Dubliners. You said his mistrust. I was going to fill in the word with disdain. Mm -hmm. That's a better Um, word. I don't I don't understand why he's writing except read his own words on a page. He doesn't seem to care about anybody or like anybody. Yeah. <laughs> it's just he he doesn't like his characters, he doesn't like people. He kind of seems to hate everybody and he seems to especially hate Dublin. Right. <laughs> like Dublin and all of its people are a cursed lot of miserable wretches who can't escape the horror of their own circumstances like that's the only point i feel like i can draw from each of these stories yeah well he did hate dublin he did leave (laughs) dublin (laughs) so i think that you're picking up on something that he actually felt well i mean you know i didn't know that backstory before you you gave it but i think nathan and i talked about it yeah beforehand it's just like i what i actually said to you if joyce is right then i hate dublin too Mm -hmm. like these people are ugly and yeah and what i said in response to you is i just i refuse to believe it i just think that joyce hates he just hates everybody and you said i sir i give you you didn't say it in these words but you said sir i give you uh, seamus heaney i don't know what else you said you had another good one up your sleeve like here's why the whole irish character actually doesn't suck based on c.s lewis was he originally Irish? Oh, I know what I gave you. I gave, I gave you an Irish character. Oh, did you? Oh, you gave me, uh, yes, our favorite. Um, from Sam. Sam. East of Eden, Steinbeck. From, from East Steinbeck. Of Eden. Oh, yeah. yeah Sam. Yeah. What's his He's name? He's a good old Irishman. He's a good old Irishman. Sam, Samuel Hamilton. Sam yeah. Hamilton. Yeah. What I felt reading him was, this is a young man, and he was pretty young when he wrote mm-hmm. these. He was in his 20s still. He was discovering his art. I don't think that many people actually write anything good in their 20s. Yeah. Usually experimenting and becoming the writer they will be in their 30s. Mm-hmm. So you see, for example, you see that with Bradbury, mm-hmm. right? So Fahrenheit 451 is not his greatest work, but you see him working out what would eventually become Bradbury the artist and sure. the great writer. And so with James Joyce, the tragedy, I think, is that he could have become something really good. Yeah. Yeah. Had he found some sort of hope and love for humanity, but Ulysses and all that, he just is what Jake was picking up on with him is that he just loved the sound of his own writing voice. Mm -hmm. He just really, really liked the fact, like kind of like Hemingway. Yeah. He really liked to read his own prose. I like to read their, both of those men's prose too, but 
<clears throat> but it's cold. It is cold, yeah. And it's heartless. There are some stories that get at a kernel of something. Mm-hmm. Like the the story about the father after he goes home and he yells at the baby. Yeah. Is that the same story where he punches out his boss and then goes and gets drunk? Is that the same guy? No, that that's home? the guy. That guy's going to cane his kid. Okay, yeah. I'll say the... I'll say the Mary. Mary for your father. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pa. Oh, pa. <laughs> It's the guy, he goes and his friend comes back and he's oh, successful, yeah. that successful journalist. Mm-hmm. My little man, my little yeah. man. Yeah, he's just insanely jealous of his friend the whole and time. And he thinks he could be a poet and, yeah. and he really wants to be a poet. Mm-hmm. And but, he goes home and he's got this nagging wife. So she leaves and leaves him with the baby and says, just don't wake the baby up. And then the baby wakes up. And then just his epiphany is he's a horrible person. Right. Like how could, and every father has felt that moment. Just no stall, it's not just all butterflies and rainbows when holding a screaming baby. Is it not? No. Sometimes, Sometimes you have you thoughts pass through your head that make you realize how horribly wicked you are. Yep. I figure none of that will happen if I ever have a baby. No, it won't. I figure I'll just, just I'll be Barney and nail it. Thomas the Tank in yep. the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so that to say, so he did have some awareness of human psychology. Well, he's a great observationist, if that's, that's a word, right? Is that yeah. a word? Yeah. Yeah. Like everything in this, in these stories is well observed down to the way that the people behave. The details are good. Yeah. The details of the psychology are good. I mean, he knows himself. He knows people. I assume a lot of what he's describing with the young men characters, especially like the gentleman, the guy that you just talked about, who's jealous of his friend, Mm -hmm. is stuff that Joyce had felt like, oh, I'm 10 times the talent that this guy is, but he's really popular for some reason. What's going on? Do you think that's that's what Joyce felt? I'm reading into it wildly here, but I'm sure he'd had that moment in his life somewhere or other. Or the story about the conniving mother who allows the guy to basically sleep with her daughter and then sets it all up and it gets a good little match for her daughter. Or the other story about the mother that ruins things for her daughter with the theater thing. The, the whole theater story. Those are well observed stories of human nature and of how people behave and shoot themselves in the foot. There's just no compassion for any yeah. of them. I mean, it's not supposed to be sad, I don't think. Some of them are, perhaps, but like I keep thinking about the Cohen brothers. And the Cohen brothers, especially their early work, is just about how stupid people are. And the Cohen brothers are really condescending in a movie like Fargo or, or any of their great movies. You know, it's about stupid people doing stupid things and punishing themselves through their own stupidity. The Cohen brothers movies are really entertaining and I, I tend to like them because they approach it with irony and it's funny and you're allowed to take a, enough of a step back from it that you can see the whole cartoon that is human nature at its worst but here it's dour and humorless and it's like what am i actually supposed to get out of this Mm -hmm. you know i mean is that an unfair question to i want to give joyce due credit he's doing something and he's doing it well i suppose but man i had he's painting what he thinks is a very realistic picture of dublin that is really bleak and nasty i don't actually i'm not sure i believe what i just said because i i almost especially knowing the history want to I'm not. I'm not going to be able to to think of it as being less than vindictive. Feels yeah. like he's settled, settling scores with people. Yeah, he knew those that conniving mother, and he wanted to. Yeah, he's paint just a nice, a, he's just going to. Yeah, that's what I really suspect is he's just like being nasty and attacking people, the city in general, and real people that he knew. And this is my I hate you. What's the difference between something like what he's doing and something like our beloved, my beloved Jane Austen? who obviously probably knew most of the characters that she makes fun of in exaggerated form. And she's probably settling some scores and doing justice on the page, what could never happen in real life. Why do we say, yeah, Jane Austen, go get him? But Joyce were like, ugh. First of all, I'm not sure I'm willing to give that uh, that Jane was settling scores with people. But Me neither. <laughs> Um, <laughs> to get back, it's a dumb question. But but <clears throat> but she's painting human nature based on real observations, and she's painting yeah, it but sometimes she, in a very bleak way. Seems to me there's always, even in the most awful characters, there's some compassion, and they're in contrast to heroes and good people. And so when there is somebody who's singled out who gets what's coming to them, it's in a context where there's hope and joy and humor in life. And this is humorless, bleak. There is no redemption. There is no good. There is no... It's just stupid people get what they deserve. 
It's not even they get what they deserve. I don't know if many of the characters get anything, right? Yeah, they just sort of for spin, people, they're just spinning their wheels. Stupid yeah. people are trapped by their own stupidity. So it's not like there's there's not the so the Coen brothers are more like Flannery O'Connor because they're stupid people, but they get there's just, a kind of a divine. There's yeah some sort of weird thing that happens in the narrative where the author is not like a Deus Ex Machina, yeah. but. And something O'Connor. in the story happens to judge the character. There's a hand of providence yeah. that is with Flannery. This O'Connor's. is a it, in, in yeah. O'Connor and in the Coen Brothers is that you feel that sort of sense that providential hand guiding the story. It may be and different, he, prov- like in yeah. Flannery, it's the hand of really just Catholic God that she believed in. In the Coen Brothers, it's the providential hand of the Coen Brothers who are kind of laughing at us and right. But in in Joyce, it's the cold cosmos. That's right. And the author gives it meaning by pulling out some symbolism here and there for us. And so you do have, and he's he's the one who sees how Catholicism has ruined Ireland, mm-hmm. has made it where everybody's paralyzed and can't act. And so maybe he has sympathy for them, but you get the sense that it's more just a Wes Anderson character or something. Mm-hmm. One of those, like Bill Murray's character from the Royal Tenenbaums is... Did he, is that where he plays a psychiatrist? Yeah. Where he can see everybody's failings, but he's just so sad he doesn't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. Right. And so the one character you really get fully f- fleshed out for us and you feel that James Joyce kind of sympathizes with is Gabriel. But that's because he is Gabriel. Gabriel and the dead. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I began to lose hope in this book around the time of, well, it was the second story, really, The Encounter, where two boys just run into a lewd old man who I think exposes himself to them, although it's not really clear. And then you don't know what happens. You don't really know what happens, but he's obviously a pervert. And that story was actually really effective in making me feel uncomfortable. Like, oh, this is a good story about two boys that play hooky and run into a dirty old man. But to what end? And that's and that's that's the first time I asked that question and read. Uh, OK, what was what was I supposed to? OK, good job, Joyce. You evoked that scene really well. I felt really uncomfortable, like exactly how I would have felt if I was a 12 year old and I ran into a dirty old man. Now what? I mean, that, that's it. Well, <laughs> that, is, that is the story that ends, though, where Mahoney, he runs towards him when he calls to him Mm -hmm. and he has that line he ran as if bringing me aid and i was penitent for in my heart i had always despised him a little Mm -hmm. and a nice little that was a nice uh, nice little cap there at the end yeah i don't want to be too black and white about this because some of the stories like the one about the man that had the affair with the woman did he actually consummate the affair with her or did he no call it off she She touched his cheek and he was a gentleman he ended it it. and then he feels like he's basically killed her because he condemned her to a life of only after feeling very uh, self righteous, self righteous, and proud of himself about. What well, he I, felt disdain for her that her death was so ugly too. Right. And then, how had he ever mixed himself up with someone so low? I mean, he could have been a Flannery O'Connor character. Yeah. Just she would have ended up having like some dove shaped icicle pierce his skull or something. <laughs> Who knows what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel a little. I don't know. I feel a little naked being this hard on Joyce because, I don't know, I feel like people would probably say, well, what did you expect, you know? I mean, do you think that every one of these stories has has some big moral, some big lesson? No, that's not what I'm saying. I just don't get the impression that, what? I hear, I mean, this is what it comes down to for me. I didn't care. I didn't want to read the next story. Mm -hmm. I never wanted, finished a story one time, one time I finished a story and thought, oh, I want to read the next story. Mm-hmm. And that was when I read Araby. That's it. And this is a book of short stories. It's short and it was the toughest slog of anything that we'd have done all year long, including Anna Karenina, which is 850 pages. Heart of Darkness. Heart of Darkness. Which is dense paragraphs. And Heart of Darkness words. was a joy compared to that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely, it was a joy. And I turned around like, and it was like, you know, I'd worked myself ahead and I was excited about Dubliners because it was short stories and short stories are fun and easy. And I was just going to keep flying on. It's like I hit a brick wall. Mm-hmm. And man, I, I I lost my taste for reading. Wow. You know, that's I, really <laughs> I, like I, I, I just didn't care. I didn't want to. I wanted to do anything but sit down in the evening and read this another short story and slog through another one. You know, I finally finished and I turned around and I picked up Till We Have Faces and I devoured it in two days. 
Why? Because I don't know. Lewis like loves the story he's telling and he loves the characters he's created and it's fun and he's a good writer in the not like he's not sophisticated like Joyce. He, well, he doesn't think that he's the high artist that Joyce thinks he is. Mm-hmm. He's not trying to be. He's and just trying to tell a story. Yeah. And, and that's where we always, always come down on, on this show is give us a good storyteller. If you if you got a good story and you're excited about the story and the characters and you can communicate the story to us, give us Bradbury. Yeah. Give us Steinbeck. Steinbeck. And we'll forgive you for being purple in your prose and, or having low style or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But I just can't like I I find it hard to forgive something like yeah, this. Yeah, I tried to be a in a in the last year I was in grad school. I tried to be a part of this reading group that was doing Ulysses, and I went to one meeting. And it was a prof- two professors and a bunch of grad students, and it was basically the, them sitting around trying to prove to one another two things: one, that they really loved the style and they understood how wonderful the style was. Yes, yes, everybody, the style is wonderful. Don't you see how beautiful the style is? And the other point was, and we can get all the illusions and look how smart he was. And he's a very clever guy. And that's what Joyce was. And he, you can see it here. He was a brilliant student. He was very proud. And he ended up writing stuff that matched that. Every sentence is perfectly tuned. You know, no no word is really out of place. It's very well balanced. It's beautiful sounding. But he doesn't mix that with the other things that you need, which is the compassion to really have a great story. Like with a poet, you want them to have real empathy for human feeling. For a novelist, you want them to have real compassion for the people they're writing about. And so why no, why Tolstoy and Austin are the greatest novelists we've read is because they have every bit of talent that Joyce has when it comes to prose writing, but they also have the compassion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they can tell a yarn as well. Right. You get those three things together and you have a masterpiece. Yeah. Well, I, I I don't think I mentioned this on the last episode. I hope I didn't. Did I talk about the f- what Carl Jung actually said about James Joyce? No. I don't think so. You didn't mention. Yeah, I knew they were. But I think you said that you'd come back to it. Right. I well, here yeah. I come. Carl Jung wrote this about Ulysses specifically, but I think it applies here too. What is so staggering about Ulysses is the fact that behind a thousand veils, nothing lies hidden, that it turns neither toward the mind nor toward the world, but as cold as the moon looking on from cosmic space allows the drama of growth, being, and decay to pursue its course. That's what Carl Jung said, and I think that sums up how I felt. I've not read Ulysses, but I think it sums up a lot of how I felt about Dubliners. There's no particular compassion for these characters. And for me, I think that's the that was certainly the breath of fresh air about coming to Till We Have Faces. Immediately, yeah. you realize C.S. Lewis has, and we'll be talking about this next month, but C.S. Lewis has compassion for his character. He loves the fox. The fox is based on some great scholar that he loved. And you can just feel warmth coming from that book. He's excited about telling you. I don't know why Joyce wanted to tell any of these stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know what was interesting. It's like he chose them at random. It's like he had a dart board of all the experiences of his life and he just threw darts. Oh, one time I saw a dirty old man. Oh, one time I got drunk and this happened. It's like, why does any of this matter? You're not giving the, me... You don't. Ha- it's not that it has to have a moral. It's not that it has to have a didactic point, but there has to be a reason that I read it. It has to have yeah. done something for me, even if it, ju- it just had to make me feel. Like the Coen brothers, they don't particularly teach me anything besides that people are stupid, but at least they make me feel suspense or they make me laugh at my own stupidity at the stupidity of these other people you know it's like joyce isn't or sorrow i mean or sorrow yeah in no country for old men you feel sorrow for what is this llewellyn and the girl yeah llewellyn and the girl yeah yeah sorrow and that's what i kind of expected from these stories because they are so sad they're about people trapped by the past trapped by guilt trapped by shame trapped by these different things but you're not really given a way into that you know maybe you bring some of that and you feel sad for this or that story but you don't get the impression that joyce ever felt all that Mm -hmm. sad no it's because he wasn't i don't think he was very sad for them with an author so he's trying to be very this is realism he's trying to distance himself because he felt like that's how you make high art but if you're going to have an ultimate uh, like someone who's really rigidly realist like that where he's completely trying to take himself out of the storytelling Mm mm-hmm so Steinbeck, he doesn't take himself out of the no, story. All. He's all over his story. Mm-hmm. And so is Dickens and guys, you know, Austin in a way is not at all either. She's very much, her voice is there. Tolstoy, his voice is there, but he's still trying to be a realist. But he has the compassion for his characters mm-hmm. there. I think that's the, so, I was just thinking about the difference between, because Tolstoy is so 
much of a realist and what he gives you all he gives you all the materials it's it's like you're watching a movie or you're just transported in time or something when you read yeah. Tolstoy similar to what Joyce does with his prose but Tolstoy has such compassion and empathy for everyone everyone in his stories whether it's the count whether it's the seducer whether it's Anna's stupid brother whether it's Anna's husband whether it's Anna herself whether it's yep. um everybody you know there's got to be at least I want to say over 20 characters that we just are, maybe it's just 10, but yeah, yeah. if it's 10, then that's 10 more than you know, we get in a lot of books, you know, where we're just, we suddenly know them and we know how they feel and we feel what they feel. And it's, mm -hmm. it's that, it's that, it's that way with war and peace too. Mm -hmm. You have like a cast of 50 characters and you feel for each and every one of them. Even the small characters get like this moment that captures who they are. And Tolstoy was able to work with symbolism as well and have that, a lot of people praise the symbolism in this. But that doesn't make it a great work of art. And so with Joyce, T.S. Eliot was writing at the exact same time. Um, Ulysses was published in 1922. Wasteland was published in 1922. Both kind of worthless just modernist artifacts, really not worth reading. T.S. Eliot went the opposite direction, though, and he actually became warmer and because he became a Christian. Mm -hmm. And so some of his later poetry, some of his his best poems is his Possum's Book of Practical Cats sure. for kids. It's amazing. It's really fun to read to your kids. My kids love mm -hmm. to read it out loud. And so, you guys all go see the musical Cats. You sing oh, yeah. songs along. You dress in glitter. You dress in glitter. You put on a cat tail. Yeah. Cat tails. <laughs> Cavity, McCavity. It's actually, no I hate one. the fact that that's based on T.S. Eliot's book. I really hate that Why fact. Why did they do that? Why did Andrew Funny Lee fact, do it? you guys know my dad. Yeah. That's the only musical he's ever gone to see. <laughs> I can and see he, why he would never go to He Edison. hated it. <laughs> of course he did. No. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Poor guy. <laughs> of course he never saw another one. I'm sorry. What were you saying? Oh, so that's the trajectory. Yeah. Lewis, not Lewis, T.S. Eliot went. went on, yeah. And then he wrote some fun plays like Murder in the Cathedral. Mm -hmm. And then, but Ulysses, James Joyce just went further up. Up can't, Creek. I can't say up that. Into, <laughs> further up now, into his yeah, head. Yeah, well, what? There are... A thousand metaphors for James Joyce, and none of them are appropriate for yeah. a family-friendly podcast. But we can say, you know what they are, folks. Yeah. You listening. know what they are. You know what they so, are. So the last point I was going to make then, along with that metaphor I can't say, right. the character that he the, is the most like is the perverted old man. He is an exhibitionist with his work. Because yeah. all his writing is just about himself. It's just like, look. Very self-involved. Yeah. And that is what you never want with good art. You mm -hmm. don't want the author to be self-involved. That's the problem with Hemingway, too, is he was just over there drinking his wine and like, look at me. I'm amazing. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but Hemingway, at least, like, is kind of amazing. I mean, he Hemingway is, was a kind but... of a manly guy with the... He was a jerk, but his bravado is its own entertainment, at least. It's kind of fun. But at it, least it, it get, fun. But I it gets mean, tiresome. It, it does get very tiresome. Because T.S. Eliot became good when he f began to forget about T.S. Eliot. Like The Lord of the Rings, it's good because Tolkien didn't care about Tolkien. He just cared about the world he was creating. Yeah. Right? Yep. That's my thesis, is that he's very, very self-involved. He's a narcissist, mm -hmm. and that just makes for a bad artist. Well, he knows himself very well and, and he's so very, gabriel is well drawn yeah he, he's he's and he's not afraid to use himself in a way that i i, I want to say like the word pornographic but that's not quite right but it's like when you said exhibit ex, exhibitionist i think that's right james joyce has an almost bad lack of shame about just like a good writer i think will draw the line somewhere in terms of how deep he explores his own wretchedness it's jake's august augustine thing folks you can listen to... What was that? What episode was that? Look at the carcass. Oh, that you can listen is. to our Millhauser part two. Yeah, that's what it was. Uh, that's a really good episode of The Bookening, by the way. Nice discussion of art. If you skip that one because you don't care about Millhauser or whatever, Jake had some nice things to say in that one. Um, okay. You should go back and listen to it. Thanks. Okay. There are two stories that we did like in this. Right, guys? Yeah. The first one was Ulysses, or no, <laughs> Freudian slip. Not even a Freudian slip, because it's revealed it's nothing about me. Um, just a slip. Uh, the first one was Araby. Yep. Yeah, I liked Araby when I read it. Why'd you like Araby, Jake? I could probably convince myself to hate it now, mm -hmm. having it in context. I just thought it was super evocative. It, it took me back to when I was, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 years old, and... You're starting to really crush on on a girl or something like that, and you have these 
I guess I should, in case people haven't read it, Araby, which, by the way, spoiler alert, don't bother reading any of the Dubliners, probably, except for the dead in Araby, maybe. But I guess we'll decide that at the end. But if you haven't read it, what what, what happens in Araby? It's about a boy who's probably about... Yeah, it's been so long since I've read it. But yeah, he's probably, you know, he's probably, what, 12 or 14 years, between 12 and 14. He's young, he's and he's crushing on a girl. Crushing hard on the neighbor girl. Um, a little bit older than him. He really wants to go to this market and buy something cool and special for her and he's pestering his mom and dad about it and pestering and pestering and pestering them they're putting it off they don't really care or see how important it is to him personally because he's so focused on doing this thing uh finally dad's like oh yeah 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 that thing i forgot you know and he's like runs and gets on does he get on a train i don't remember whatever he yeah. it takes him Somehow he gets he gets there basically at closing time and he has to rush around and try to find something and can't find the right thing. And then he realizes he's just not going to be able to pull it off. And it's frustrating and sad. And um, I've had that exact experience multiple times, I feel like at least. of As a kid, you had that experience. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think it's been a wanting to buy something neat or cool or special for a girl, for a girlfriend or some girl I was crushing on. And it'd be like a Tuesday or Thursday night. Tuesdays and Thursday nights, we went to visit with my mom. And that was like from 5.30 to 8 o'clock. We had this window of time. Sometimes I could convince her to take us to the mall if we had time or something like that. And that's when I would try to do something like that because my dad would never be on board with that. But mom would let me run the mall. And it just evoked all these feelings of like 12 to 13 to 14 year old romantic Jake who's going to go into Claire's and find a necklace or earrings or something that was kind of, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Girl. I don't know what it was. But this that frustration of mm. that anxiety of we're running out of time. I have this thing I want to do. I really care. I want to try. And then, you know, it just never really. It doesn't work. Yeah. Working and nobody really cares and feels the pressure that you feel. And I hadn't felt those feelings in a long time. You know, he nailed it. That was kind of fun in a very painful sort of way. But it was just Oh, yeah, I remember that guy. That was miserable. What an awful time of life. I would never want to live that over again. <laughs> I'm so glad that I am now happily married with children <laughs> and not 12 to 14 years old and full of romantic angst. But I thought then, I, you know, after that's like the third, second or third story in the in the book, right? Mm-hmm. The third. And so I thought, well, man, if he if he can do that and keep kind of doing that for me, and evoking some of these childhood memories or feelings. Then it'd be worth it. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, then you just come to realize he doesn't actually care about that boy. He thinks that boy's stupid. He saw himself as a creature driven and derided by vanity. (laughs) Eyes burned with anguish and anger. Yeah, he's just like that kid. (laughs) Yeah, well... It is right, like it is how you you feel so stupid. Mm, like you just yeah. feel this is all so stupid. I'm so stupid. Yeah, and you're right about everything the... I'm trying to do. This is so stupid. What's wrong with me? Yeah. Even if I had come up with a perfect, what was I gonna do? Was it really gonna work? It was. What's and the details uh, are all good too because he goes into the one shot. Well, the lights are already going off in all the other stalls, so it's already growing dark. Yep. inside this big warehouse where he's in. And then he goes to the one stall that's like still open and the teenage girl is over there flirting with the boys. Yeah. Right. Doesn't so pay doesn't him wanna... any mind. She's irritated that she has yeah. to wait on him. Yep. Yeah. But yep. also kind of worried that he might be shoplifting. And mm. so he's trying to look like, and so you can just feel it. Yeah. The tension's there. So he's he actually really is good at the dramatic narrative tension when he wants to be. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, that's the dead is all over the dead. Right. It's just slowly building this whole party and then all these foolish characters and some of them not foolish, but the closest he gets to sympathy too is for those ants. I think he doesn't hate the ants. For the three ants, yeah. 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 Who are definitely based on real people per yeah. my limited research. Yeah, I think it's like if if Joyce was just a man that was plucking random things from his experience and just turning them, transforming them into art for whatever purpose he thought he was achieving. Araby's the one that probably most people that read the book, most men, I imagine, would just connect with. I don't think that Joyce cared anything more for it than the others or meant anything more for it, but it certainly strikes a chord. I hated it, actually, for that reason. Maybe it's because I'm not happily married with kids, but I have absolutely no desire to relive that part of my life. I hate everything about myself from that age. And those experiences, like yep. the experience of like being in love and it meaning all this. I mean, that I just like, ugh. if I met Joyce, I would punch him 
in the kidneys specifically for writing Arab B among his many other sins <laughs> because I just, I just like it's it, it's great it's well evoked but for me it's like yeah you also evoked that child molester real well too great good job <laughs> good on you now what I realize I'm being nasty though it's a great it's a good story I understand why people like it I just for me it was painful to read I read it is painful mm-hmm. if I weren't so far removed right then I I probably would hate that story too. I feel decently far removed. Most of the time, I, I feel pretty sectioned off from that part of my life. I try not to think about it. But then James Joyce comes along and he's like, remember when you sucked <laughs> and everything sucked <laughs> and girls were pretty and older than you and you really wanted one? Remember that? It's like he's yeah. poking me with a stick. <laughs> yeah. Stop. And then also telling you, you still suck. Right. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> they'll suck. We all suck. Yeah. Anything else to say about Arabi? No. Well, the other story, the one that I really liked, and and Jake was having a little trouble getting through the book, as he said. I think we all had a little trouble getting through this book. And Jake said, ah, man, give me some motivation. And I said, you got to get to the end of the dead. It's worth it. It's actually worth the whole stupid book because the dead is actually, as it turns out, a great story. And I stand by that. Maybe James Joyce only wrote one thing in his life that lived up to the promise that he had, but it's the dead, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's because it's... uh... Irish. Yeah. It's about loss and death and sadness and mm-hmm. ghosts. And yeah. It's just Irish. The whole thing's wonderful. It reminds me a little bit of the opening hour or whatever of The Godfather, where you're just at the, before all the mafia stuff, yeah. where you're just at the wedding and you're just observing the kind of Italian culture and The Godfather's in his office talking to people and you're seeing all these different little vignettes and it just reminds you of every drunken party that you've ever had with your family So and all the different characters and all the different relationships. So there's that, which is something that Tolstoy was really good at too those kinds of party scenes he was yep. always good at but the details are good there oh they're perfect yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. i had i had trouble at the beginning but that was because i didn't have you'd lost all trust in, i'd lost trust and hope that he was going to deliver anything right and so it was just more we we get started with gabriel being this painfully self-conscious self-aware and uh, incapable of managing himself kind of accidentally has an awkward moment with the maid and then it's kicking himself and like saying the wrong thing or something and yeah and then but then he can't manage to take those observations and turn them into anything good Mm -hmm. yeah like the awkward moment he has in the dance yeah with that one girl yeah Oh, where they... Doesn't quite know how to read her. And, yeah, yeah, she's just trying to have some fun with him, but... He's too self-conscious. Yeah. And... I was surprised that he pulled off the speech, by the way. Like, yeah. so the whole time he's, like, misreading people for most of the story. He misreads everyone, but then he somehow manages to... I don't know if there's any point to this, really, but he somehow manages to give a good speech that well, everybody He's in his element. It's words and stuff that he's prepared and written. That's what he's... And everybody wants to applaud him, and everybody's yeah. had a few drinks, and... For people who haven't read The Dead, what's the story of The Dead? Jake, what's what 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 happens? Spoiler, full full spoilers ahead. Dude goes to a party with his wife. You know, it's an Irish party, so everybody's going to get good and liquored up and they're going to dance and it's a lot of family. It's winter and it's snowing and he's got to give a speech in honor of the hostesses who are two aunts and a cousin or I think so. Of his, yeah. yeah. And he's an and, intellectual and he's an intellectual, and he's very self-conscious about that and about himself and about everything else. And then his wife's a, like a poor country girl or something, right? She's, she's lower like an station. Approved yeah. match. Or she's something definitely like, that. like his wife is embarrassing him at a couple of key places. She just yeah. she's saying the wrong thing. She's making fun of the galoshes, whatever. She's just like she's not playing her part like she's supposed to. Maybe she's uppity instead of a poor country girl. There comes a point in the evening where a guy that they've been badgering to sing because this is a very musical family, ends up being overheard singing in another room. And he sees his wife on the staircase, and she's stopped, and she's listening, and suddenly she looks beautiful. He starts to imagine this whole interior thing that's going on inside of her, and he gets transported to their honeymoon in these beautiful, warm, very tolstoy kind of sentiments of... Like with Levin and and, and Kitty when they were, you know, getting married or whatever. And it it gets really sweet and really bright. He's he's just enjoying his wife and loving her. And he sees 
love in her eyes, a romantic thing going on. And he's got all of these ideas and he can't wait to get back to the hotel. He's going to make love to her and it's going to be sweet and awesome. And it's going to be like their honeymoon again. And, you know, things had been dull and drab and, and suddenly, you know, the, the, all, all this stuff happens and then they, they get back to the hotel and something's wrong and he can't figure out what. And he's trying not to be frustrated. He's going to try to move her along and then finally gets her to talk and then she starts telling him about this lover that she had that she was reminded of by this song and then he realizes everything he saw he imagined and made up this is about this dude that she was in love with who died or more specifically that was in love with her we don't really know Eh. the truth exactly about how far it went or how much she reciprocated but we do know this guy stood outside the rain when he was sick because he had to come see her and then he died shortly thereafter yeah and there is our protagonist at the end with the snow falling realizing that there was somebody lying cold in a grave who had died for this woman that he's married to and you have this sort of very sorry still haven't come up with a better word for it wistful Mm -hmm. sentiment that you're left with. Brandon, you got to open and read the, since we're spoiling it, you might as well read how it ends. That's what I was going to say. The whole last paragraph? Yeah, why not? A few light taps upon the pane made him turn to the window. It had begun to snow again. He watched sleepily the flakes, silver and dark, falling obliquely against the lamplight. The time had come for him to set out on his journey westward. Yes, the newspapers were right. Snow was general all over Ireland. It was falling on every part of the dark central plain, on the treeless hills, falling softly upon the bog of Allen, and farther westward, softly falling into the dark, mutinous Shannon waves. It was falling, too, upon every part of the lonely churchyard on the hill where Michael Fury lay buried. It lay thickly drifted on the crooked crosses and headstones, on the spears of the little gate, on the barren thorns. His soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe, and faintly falling, like the descent of their last end, upon all the living and the dead. Yeah. That's quite the last paragraph. It's masterful. Probably one of the top five last paragraphs in all of literature. Yeah. I can think of a few that better it. Gatsby kind of tried it with, and so we were born back on the waves, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. this is way better than that. Still failed. Yeah. Well, it's it's a long story. It's a novella length, mm-hmm. but it does everything that a good short story tries to do. And that it has this part in the beginning where you're getting to know the characters, getting to know who they are, who we think they are. And then it has the turn at the end in the reveal where he's mad at first because he thinks she wants to go back to see Michael Fury because that song made her think of him. And he, he's frustrated because he wanted to go back <clears throat> and have some, some fun. And she suddenly is cold. And that quickly moves us into him realizing what a lot of us, I think, eventually realize is that you just really can't know another person, how unknowable everyone else is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the kind of cheesy feeling we get. I guess it's not a cheesy feeling, but you know, you'll see somebody at Walmart and you realize, you know, they have all these thoughts and aspirations and stuff and you might want to disdain them, but their life is a life and completely unknowable to you and they'll move on and they'll have relationships and children and laughter and all this stuff that you'll never see or know. And there's all, all over the world, all these lives that are being lived. And it's a weird thought to have. And all these lives that have been lived. Yeah. There's all a these word actually. The... There's a French, I think, word for this. It's the feeling, it's the feeling you literally get when you're in the mall or Walmart or something and you see someone, when, just when you meet another person and you realize they have their own story that exists outside and you get that just weird. And you have completely no access to it. Yeah, and you have no access to it. They were oh. born and they're going to die and they've and what's an not, expressible yeah. thing. And what's beautiful about that sentiment is that is what literature can do for us is it helps you have that empathy and sympathy towards other people. And so he's, he's kind of mirroring it here for us mm-hmm. in his relationship to his wife. But unfortunately, as we've seen, Joyce didn't carry that through with everything else. No. So... I guess you don't really, you know, Gabriel lives so much in his in his head, but part of his reveal, his revelation, his epiphany is that he has never loved anybody like Michael Fury, which is right. a great comic book name. Yeah. Is, <laughs> has ever, I had a professor once named Constance Fury, which is an even better yeah. comic book name, but that he's never loved anyone, including his wife. He never loved a woman like that. And it's, is it generous tears? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of my favorite parts. 
Generous his, tears filled Gabriel's eyes. And then I like, his curious eyes rested long upon her face and on her hair. And as he thought of what she must have been then in the first time of her girlish beauty, a strange, friendly pity for her entered his soul. He did not like to say even to himself that her face was no longer beautiful, but he knew that it was no longer the face for which Michael Fury had braved death. That's right. That's a wonderful, just that sentence is like, maybe that's the best way to criticize a story is to write another story. And J James Joyce wrote the criticism of the Dubliners in this because there's all the compassion, all the self-knowledge put to good use that we want in the other stories. I mean, there's just a, a really relatable human. I mean, looking at someone who's aged a little bit, looking at someone you love who's gotten older and not wanting to quite acknowledge it, but also acknowledging it. I think everybody's been there kind of a thing. And we don't know what Gabriel does with his epiphany, but it's nice to think that he could learn something about himself. You actually do feel a little bit of hope for this man. You know, maybe he'll never love like Michael Fury, but he knows that about himself and he's being kind and generous with the information. He's feeling sympathy for his wife instead of ultimately resenting her. Yeah. And it's kind of beautiful. And then it resolves into this great poetic last paragraph that just like how many writers have tried and failed to pull off something like that. Joyce just does it. Effortlessly. Effortlessly. The other famous story about anecdote about Joyce is the one about like Joyce's friend finds Joyce despondent with his head in his hands you know probably throwing back a few whiskeys and hey james how you doing oh i'm doing terrible did you write anything today yeah yeah i wrote seven words oh james well that's that's pretty good for you seven words that's great but i don't know what order they go in it's like that's a famous i don't know probably apocryphal but that's a famous heard, yeah. james joyce anecdote so it probably didn't come easy for him but he sure knocked it out of the park there I mean, I love, I love, I love, I love the fact. I love it when a writer takes a risk and gets away with it. That's one of my favorite things. Faintly falling, falling faintly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what nerve. What yeah. nerve. E.B. White and Mr. Strunk would be quite unimpressed by that. I'm yeah. sure they loved it, actually. But no writer should ever try anything. Like, his soul swooned sw slowly, tons of alliteration, as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe and faintly falling like the descent of their last end upon all the living and the dead. Like every bad high school writer writes sentences that are almost like that. But and not they're, quite. And therefore laughable. Yeah. And therefore the most ridiculous thing. Like this sentence was either going to be the most ridiculous, stupid sentence ever written, or it was going to knock it out of the park. And fortunately, because it was absolutely perfect, it knocked it out of the park. If it had been anything less, it would have been ridiculous. Yeah. Oh. James Joyce. Mon amour. Mon amour. <laughs> what a writer you could have been, Joyce. What you could have been. But you weren't, so. Nope. <laughs> Sayonara. <laughs> Fail. Anyway, you're dead now. Yep. And I'm not even sure it's snowing in Dublin at the moment. Probably not. But, you know, James Joyce is dead. My grandma's dead. Lots of people are dead. Some people are alive. We're all part of one big thing, and yet we can never know each other. And if you want to experience some of the weird sort of transcendent uh, wistfulness of that, then you should read The Dead. It's a good story. You should. Guys, would you give the BSOA, the Booking Seal of Approval, to the Dubliners? No. No. No, me neither. Would you give the BSOA to any particular stories in the Dubliners? The Dead. The Dead. The Dead. Any other stories? One about the creepy old man? Nah. No. No? No. One about the mother that's... Nope. Nah. You know. Nah, the Dead. Araby? Jake, you want to give the BSOA to Araby? Uh, I don't want to give it a seal of approval, but if you... You don't remember a really awkward time in your life as it, well, and it, it it's also short. Yep, it is very short. It it's is like quite short, One three short. or four pages yeah, or yeah, something yeah. like that. But I think it, the dead is worth the trouble. It's 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 a it's a read. It'll it'll require some mental energy on your part. But if if you want to, if you don't want to read a novella, but want to see what Joyce can do and move on, then you can read Araby. But you really should just read the dead. Yeah, you can take like uh, 90 minutes, read the dead. Yeah. Read the dead, read Arby. You'll read everything you need to read by Joyce. I th we have it on Brandon's authority. The dead is worth reading. Yeah. The dead might be one of my, I don't know, maybe that's going too far. It's good. I don't know. We'll talk about it on our best of ofs this when we get to yeah, those. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
The Boogity Day was written and produced by Nathan Alberson. It was performed by Jacob Menzel and Brandon Chastain. Go to Warhorn Media for lots more great content. You can visit us on Twitter, Facebook, whatever you want to do. You can find us on all the places. Uh, please leave us a nice review. We're so thankful for our nice reviews. Lauren ARA wrote, left us a nice one. Other yeah, people. thank you, Lauren. It was really sweet. That was really sweet. Yeah, we, we are so encouraged when we see five stars, but we're also we're really encouraged by it when people say something nice, like I like to hang out with you guys and hear your thoughts and stuff like that. That's really nice. And uh, it helps, you know, drive the volume of the podcast and enables us to do it for business reasons and stuff. It's also good. Speaking of enabling us to do it for business reasons, if you do appreciate what we do, mm -hmm. you can support us at patreon.com forward slash the booking for as little as a dollar a month, oh, $4 yeah. a month. Every little bit really does help. If everybody that listened to this podcast gave a dollar a month, we'd have a lot of money. That's actually. true. Um, like a million dollars, I think. A couple million? A, couple a month? A month. Yeah, at least. Yeah. We'd have a couple thousand. Yeah, yeah. We'd have a couple thousand a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, come on, people. That's not much. Yeah, it's it's just the dollar. It's just the dollar, dollar. guys. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do ten? Four dollars, ten dollars, ten dollars and get a donor shout out. Donor shout out, get your name. We'll come up with a fun All, nickname for you. Man, All it would make... thousand of you, yeah. It yeah would, that would it, just... How would we do that? <laughs> it, it would make... It would make... Uh, this show much easier to do yep we love doing it we're not we're not gonna stop doing it we're not making threats here but make it easier for us help us justify it as a nice business expenditure for our overlords you know war on media we've got boards and stuff and things you know how the money people are folks just make it easy for everybody hey thanks for listening hey if you want to also if you don't want to do the whole patreon thing because whatever you don't want to do the whole patreon thing you can go to warhornmedia.com click the big old give button on the right hand uh, side you can make a tax deductible donation to Warhorn Media that'll go towards lots of fine work that we do that Jake does that I do right. and other fine people do including your beloved literature podcast the number one literature podcast as far as I'm concerned The Bookening so yeah thanks for listening see you next week Brandon goodbye Nathan see you next week Jake goodbye Nathan bye everybody goodbye to all the living and the dead <laughs> bye living Bye, Dad. <laughs> <laughs>